This is An American Workplace, a podcast dedicated to rewatching and discussing NBC's beloved mockumentary series, The Office. My name is Chad Hopkins, and joining me, as always, is my good friend and co-host, Katie White. Katie, how are you doing today? I am well, Chad. Uh, we are recording a few episodes here, uh, getting ready for Christmas so that we can enjoy time with our families, um, and I'm really excited to go home for Christmas this year. Um, really, really looking forward to it. I was, I was up in New York last year, so ready to be home, already there. Yeah, this is technically our Christmas episode because it'll be going up the week of Christmas. I haven't decided yet if it's going to go up on Christmas or on our normal Thursday, uh, but you'll get it next week at some point. And so yeah. happy Christmas, everybody. <laughs> Hello. Yay. My favorite. <laughs> and while we're on the subject of wishing people happy Christmas, we've got a special shout out to Caitlin Pulley from us and from her husband, Rhett. Rhett emailed us a couple weeks ago, said, hey, can you give Caitlin a shout out on the podcast? And we were like, that is adorable. Let's do it. <laughs> and so here we are wishing you, Caitlin and Rhett as well, a very Merry Christmas. We're so glad you enjoy the podcast. We hope you have the best of Christmases and we love you to 2005 video iPods worth. Ah, uh, what a great episode. <laughs> Um, and if you're a Patreon subscriber, um, you will likely be hearing a little bit more about video iPods uh, here, maybe in a couple of bonuses. Um, yeah, maybe. We, we, we've, got a, we've got a Christmas bonus planned here in a bit. So we also have uh, a thank you for Marta and Joey for reaching out on Twitter. Slid into our DMs there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. So thanks, Marta and Joey. Uh, nice to hear from you both. And let's jump into it. Uh, our first episode to discuss this week is Christening. It aired on November 4th of 2010, was directed by Alex Hardcastle and written by Peter Ako, who I, I don't know if I've ever heard those names before, but... I know, I think they're, they're newbies uh, for us. I don't know. Cece, Jim and Pam's daughter, is getting christened, and the entire office shows up unexpectedly. Jim and Pam deal with a food shortage at the reception, while Michael enjoys the community that the church provides. He and Andy decide to join the youth group that is leaving that day for a mission trip in Mexico. They're not on the road for long when Michael realizes his mistake and bails. Okay, starting off with uh, Jim and Pam. I got a quick little storyline here. Uh, they are christening Cece, who's a few months old at this point, probably. And they, I, I, I don't know how this came about, but Michael has invited the entire office to the christening. Michael says, because today is not just about Pam or Jim or the baby or me, Michael. It's about all of us. And, you know, it's, it's really not. It's not about any of you. I don't understand how Michael even found out about it. I would almost be willing to bet that Michael found out about this through overhearing a conversation or spying on their email because we know he has that capability. And I, I just cannot picture jim and pam inviting him to this no because it's a very private thing and there's no reason that michael would be there and there's really no need for the entire office to be there but sure enough they're all there and cc is on deck she's about to go up and be christened and she needs to be changed right before so um she's wearing her pretty white christening dress and there was uh an accident while jim was changing her the dress is completely ruined and they don't have a spare even though there was supposed to be a spare but there wasn't a spare um, so Cece gets christened in an arcade fire t-shirt. Um, <laughs> Jim, uh, said that he checked the bag or backup outfit and he definitely did not. On the subject of Michael's involvement there, uh, he, at the very beginning of the christening, before it really starts, he says, he, he walks up and he does a Godfather impersonation. And I don't know whether he seriously was trying to assert himself as the godfather of cc or he was just joking around and jim and pam can't take a joke i i don't know what to think of michael here uh but what is strange to me i've got to admit is that the person the, the people who are cc's godparents are people that jim and pam have really only known for a year uh, maybe that's a usual thing it's somebody that they met in mommy and me and I can understand Jim and Pam not choosing Michael or anybody from the office really to be the godparents, but why not like Isabel or somebody who they've known for a while, who they have a more 
intimate relationship with. Maybe maybe I'm coming out of left field here. Maybe that's a standard practice, but it just seems uh, to to place somebody in such a position within your family, you'd have a deeper connection than oh yeah, we met in mommy and me a few months back. You know? Yeah, I agree. Um, I think Michael kind of assumed he was the Godfather because. Who else spends as much time with Jim and Pam as me? Mm -hmm. Which, I mean, on that account, he is correct. But not that they would trust Michael with their baby. But yeah, I agree that it's a little odd that they pick someone who's a very new friend. But eh, maybe they're very, very close. And um, yeah, I don't have any kids, so I'm not sure on the uh, protocol there. Me neither. (laughs) The crux of what's happening with Jim and Pam this episode, after the whole baby in an arcade fire t-shirt debacle uh they were meant to have an intimate reception with their invited guests yet the pastor announces to the entire congregation that there's a reception that is open to everybody and so the disaster is that there's not enough food or drink for everybody who shows up and not let alone that jim and pam don't even know half or more than half of the people who are there uh celebrating their baby so it's a little strange but uh that that's pretty much all that happens with that there's not really any resolution with that although jim does briefly misplace cc yes angela how rare has been acting weird all day and um hates the whole situation and is just grumpy all the time and but she really loves cc i mean she's a cute baby it's what's not to like especially for angela and uh Jim, I guess, kind of picks up on that, and Jim leaves Cece with Pam's grandmother, Mima, who we saw in Niagara, and she loses the baby, or misplaces her, or forgets, really, that Pam's mom, Helene, picked her up. Jim then thinks that Angela stole the baby? I'm not really sure where his train of thought went, like, why he thought that, uh, but really, it's just that Helene had the baby. Yeah, <laughs> well, somebody did say it was a smaller blonde woman. Mm -hmm. And so he just made that leap to Angela, which I I wouldn't say is completely unreasonable. (laughs) But uh, Angela did steal some scones, but that's (laughs) she did she did not steal a baby. But yeah, that that's that's pretty much all that happens with Jim and Pam this episode. So the bulk of the rest of the conversation is going to go to Michael and a little bit towards Andy. Michael, after the whole yeah, I, I I'm not the Godfather situation and. Poor Michael and poor Pam, she she understands how much this is really hurting Michael to fully admit, okay, I'm not the godfather. She says, Michael, I need you I need you to say it out loud. I'm so I'm so sorry, Michael. Like I I, I understand how much you want this, but I need to know that you know you are not the godfather. And so that's when Michael starts getting a little bit upset. But then he learns that church really suits him. Uh everyone's really happy to be there. They all shake his hand and they all give him a smile and a good morning, sort of boost his self-confidence. He says, I am feeling this. Call it the Holy Spirit or the passion of the Christ. I am loving these people. And that just sort of snowballs as they get into the reception and everybody's hanging around each other closer. And then he he listens to the youth pastor talk about their upcoming trip to Mexico, or really today they're they're leaving for Mexico. And Michael is just so overwhelmed by the sense of community and family. And as we know, that's Michael's jam. I mean, that's Mm -hmm. all he wants is that that sense of community. Um, So when she stands up to make that announcement, Michael is so moved. um, He's snapping at everyone who's not paying attention. He's really invested in this idea. And he's just so, I don't know, he's he's very moved. He kind of snaps at the employees uh, who came to to the christening. He says... You're talking, is it appropriate? What's wrong with you? What is so horrible about people wanting to get together and do something nice? Why did you even come today? What's so great about your lives that you think you're better than everyone else? You can make fun of everyone else. You're mean. You're mean girls. He likens them to the movie Mean Girls. (laughs) And he's just really upset that people aren't taking this more seriously. And ultimately, as we see, he decides to join the mission trip on a whim. He, He kind of meets the teens and says goodbye kind of in their recessional, if you will, and decides that he wants to join this mission trip. And like, this is something that he really wants to do. I don't think it's because he wants to help people as much as it is that he wants to just be a part of this. That's what I was going to say. It's such a misunderstanding of what exactly these people are setting out to do. Yeah, they're together. Yeah, they like each other. 
But it's not about seeking approval from one another like Michael is seeking. It's about doing good in a community that needs it for no reward, for no recognition, other than the feeling of doing something good. And though Michael is keen on the front part, he's not so keen on the back part. It's it's Michael wants the recognition. He, we've pointed out before he wanted the, the hospital wing named after him because he gave a donation. And he wants people to know that it's named after him because he's the one who gave the donation. Like it, it's it's just Michael's MO that he needs to be recognized. He needs to have that, that celebratory relationship with other people. So he does join Andy gets wrapped up in it as well because Aaron says she thinks it's cool that Michael is leaving. She says, I wish I had a job. I could just get up and leave. So Andy says, sure, I'm in too. Trying to impress Aaron and they don't even know what they're setting out to do, but here they go leaving for Mexico. Everyone's trying to convince them to get off the bus. And as you said, Andy, I, I don't know if I feel like he's trying to impress Aaron or if he just feels like it's time to do something drastic because like this isn't working with Aaron or mm-hmm. he just needs to escape Aaron. I don't know what it is. But yes, he, he joins Michael. And as soon as the excitement calms down, they've been on the road for about half an hour, 45 minutes. Michael starts freaking out. What are we building? Why aren't they building it in Mexico? Weren't there more people on this bus before, like two or three (laughs) hundred? No, it's a charter bus. He decides that he has to get off the bus. The bus driver says, nope, next stop's in Tennessee. They're in Pennsylvania. That's a ways away. And they cause enough of a scene that the driver ultimately stops and lets them out of the bus on the side of the road. And a kid from the mission trip gets off too. He doesn't want to do this anymore either. (laughs) Yeah, he says, don't tell my parents. Yeah. The irony of this is Aaron comes to pick Andy and Michael and this kid up and she says, hey, everybody went and saw a movie, actually. So the irony is after they've found out they've changed their minds, what Michael wanted, which was everybody to hang out and do something together, happened in his absence. And it's not necessarily because of his absence. It just sort of organically happened. And because Michael tried to go off and do his own thing that he didn't fully understand, he missed out on the opportunity. So. Sucks for you, Michael, but that that's the way things go, I guess. There was a quick, not even really a storyline with Toby, except that uh, we see that he does not feel comfortable going into a church. He says it's been a few years and the, quote, big guy, and he has some catching up to do. Which is interesting because we learned in Casual Friday in season five that he went to seminary. Mm-hmm. So he's definitely taken a, a 180 on his um, approach to religion. He attempts to go into the church after the service has started, but he can't make it through the door. He finally makes it in after everyone's left. And all he says is, why you always got to be so mean to me talking to God? <laughs> Pretty heartbreaking. His total change of heart. Yeah, it's a bummer. I- I've seen some people online talk about how it doesn't really make sense for Toby to have this uh, trepidation at entering a church because... He went to a church for both Phyllis's wedding and for Pam and Jim's wedding. But the key difference here is that this is a church service. This isn't a wedding service. I think there's there's a very different thing there. And he does specify in the quote, he says, Sunday church service, it's been a few years. So that that's the difference here. It's specifically having that that one-on-one intimate interaction with God that you get in a church service that Toby so anxious to avoid. And it is a bummer that he he blames all of his misfortunes in his life on God. Uh, but that's Toby, I guess. He has had a, a sad life. <laughs> well, on that happy note, let's go into the funny moments. <laughs> yes, please. This is the cold open. Pam is spreading awareness about cold and flu season, how to reduce the spread of germs, etc. Pam says that the number of germs on your computer keyboard is greater than the number of germs on a toilet seat. Kelly makes a your mama joke about being dirty, and Michael, of course, chimes in on that uh, because he dated Pam's mom, and he confirms that she does have more germs in a toilet seat. Uh. Uh, nice. Pam mentions that she'll be setting up hand washing stations around the office. This is my favorite bit about the cold open. Dwight is emphatically against this. He said that they will cost you your life that you'll be coddling your immune system. If Sabre really cared about your well-being, they'd just set up hand desanitizing stations filled with dirt, vomit, fecal matter. So Jim begins this 
trend of, okay, so we're going to help you out. We're going to sneeze on you every time we have to sneeze. Um, <laughs> Dwight said he's, he'd welcome that. You know, he'll live longer. So Jim sneezes in Dwight's face, which prompts everyone all day long to run up to Dwight and sneeze on him, his food, whatever else. Um, and you can tell he's regretting agreeing to this. Yeah, I, I love Aaron, like, sprinting across from reception to sneeze on him. <laughs> and then when Andy sneezes on his uh, piece of toast and Dwight has no choice but to reluctantly pull it up to his mouth and take a tiny nibble. <laughs> yeah. Even though it's kind of devastating to uh, Carla, who is the sort of leader of the young adult ministry when Michael and Andy sort of completely freak out over getting the bus to stop. And Andy's almost like to the point of tears to stop the dang bus. <laughs> he's, he's so upset. It just makes me laugh that he gets so upset about it. And Michael's response is, it is so nice to be back in a country that has movies as if you ever left it. And like, guess what? Mexico has movies too. And the nice one yeah. by Alfonso Cuaron just premiered on Netflix. You're welcome. And he's probably still in Pennsylvania. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's, you're fine. You've they had just the left Lackawanna County. Yes. Dwight in the church is handing out his business card to people as they enter the church for all your printer and paper needs, he says. <laughs> um, and then he stands up during the prayer request section of the service and tells everyone that uh, because of the dying middle class, he's doing everyone a favor and can offer them a 4% discount on all Dunder Mifflin Scranton products. If you buy a printer at full cost, which this is not only not church related and inappropriate, it's also not a very good sale. <laughs> no, not at all. 4%. <laughs> if you buy a full printer too. If, yeah. Yeah. I love when they are at the reception for CC, and this grumpy old woman came, comes up and grabs an empty platter and says, what were these? Jim says, scones. She says, I didn't get any. Pan says, well. If it makes you feel any better, I didn't get any either. And then she picks up the jug of cider and says, and just the one jug of cider? And so she runs off and Pan says, who was that? <laughs> Jim's response says, I think that was Sconesy Cider, noted baptism reception critic. <laughs> I've had that name stuck in my head inexplicably for the past couple of days. I don't, I don't know why I can't explain it, but Sconesy Cider. cider. <laughs> um, Michael, it's not... <laughs> Super funny. I mean, it is, but it just makes me laugh. His reaction to, um, he's just jealous of, of Cece's relationship with her parents, you know, how infants are. But he's like, I don't even know how to say this, but Cece is turning out to be a little B-I-T-C-H, and that's not true. But her parents are kind of boxing me out. <laughs> <laughs> and earlier, he had said, uh, Jim and Pam and Cece really seem to be clicking. They're totally gelling. It's as if they leave my office and they go to another office that sells happiness and good for them because, you know, paper is not going to last forever. Um, but it's like, again, you are not their family. No. They have a baby girl. She's allowed to be closer to them than you are. She is an infant and has no choice. Yeah. <laughs> like it's it's, it's going to be okay. When Jim sets down Cece in her carrier next to Mima and says, hey, hey, Mima, can you watch Cece for me? She says, fine, I guess I'll watch Suzanne's purse and your baby. Like, <laughs> this is such a... A, a chore. A, yeah, a chore. This is definitely something I don't want to do, which seems very atypical of a grandmother, but maybe it's because Cece wasn't named after her, after all. But then later, when Jim shows up and Cece's gone, he says, where's Cece? She says, I don't know. I lost the purse, too. <laughs> <laughs> Shouldn't have left this woman in charge. No. I, I like Angela's attitude towards this whole reception. She says, well, this is intimate. Uh, of course, it's not anymore. And Pam kind of jokes, yeah, we'll need a loaves and fishes kind of miracle to feed everyone. And Angela takes huge offense to joking about a Bible story. You know, Jesus mm -hmm. is not your caterer. And then she sees Cece and gets all cute. And why didn't your parents get a caterer? They don't think. <laughs> it was just her her switch between being really cute with Cece and really just annoyed at Jim and Pam. It just makes me laugh. When Aaron picks up Michael and Andy from the side of the road, uh, she pulls over and says, get in quick. Almost like she's trying to make a getaway or something. Michael asks, why quick? She responds, so it's faster. <laughs> she's got a yeah. point. Yeah. <laughs> the, the logic is sound. fast. <laughs> 
I love this moment. So Michael's on the bus. Phyllis is trying to convince him to leave. She says, Michael, what am I supposed to tell my clients if they ask about you? Michael says, tell them that I died. I turned into an angel. And then when they feel a breeze in a room or all the windows closed or that chill on the back of their neck, that's just me watching over them. <laughs> Phyllis says, okay, but what about the bigger corporate accounts? I'll just tell them that I'm in a meeting. <laughs> 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 the ones that don't really matter, you can tell them that I died. Yeah. But the real corporate accounts, yeah, they, they should know that I'm <laughs> alive. Yeah, basically. Ryan, at the end of the church service, is trying to connect to the church Wi-Fi. He says, for all their generosity of spirit, they password protect their wireless. And Kelly responds, try Jesus. And Dwight just says, Opus Dei. <laughs> <laughs> They're out church words. Also, Ryan, he's talking about Carla, the mission trip leader, after her little speech about, about going on the mission trip. He says, the Teach for America girls are way hotter, but they're nuts. <laughs> oh my uh, so he's had some experience with trying to hook up with volunteers, I guess. Yeah, he makes reference to uh, Jonestown as well with the whole drinking of the Kool-Aid in regards to following religion blindly. But whatever, Ryan. I guess my last one has to do with Daryl when Michael is making his plea to the other office employees to hang out and do something nice for people together. And everybody's grumpy. There's no food. There's no drink. Everybody's complaining. Daryl says, we are hanging out right now. You want more of this? Like, is this not bad enough? Do we really need to, uh, uh, to, to do more of this and torture ourselves further? <laughs> so moving on to some deleted scenes, Angela admits that she'd like to have a baby. She thinks that she'd be skilled at being a mother, and she thinks that the child would really appreciate, you know, her being a good mother. And in time, the child might even realize that she loved it very dearly, which, you know, some people might think that that last one is the most important, but yeah. Angela would be a good mom above everything else, and the child would appreciate her, her skill. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so I guess for Angela, being a good mother does not involve love. No. Hmm. That's a benefit. That's like a, 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 a tack on. <laughs> Kelly and Ryan have a talking head together. Kelly says she would like to have a child. She thinks mixed race babies are beautiful, i.e. telling us that she would like to have a baby with Ryan. <laughs> and Ryan says, nah, it's a bad idea because mixed babies have a lot of identity issues growing up. Kelly asks, you know, what's so hard about being beautiful? Ryan says the girls end up totally fine. But the boys have complexes, and I just don't want to risk it. I think they might have complexes because they would have you two as parents. Yeah, probably. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that, that'll do it. <laughs> Oscar has a talking head. He does not want a kid. And that if one more lesbian couple asks for his sperm, he's going to scream. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. This one's kind of sad. They are planning a family picture with Cece, the whole Halpert family. Jim waves, waves over Michael. And Michael looks excited. He's about to be included in the family picture. He starts to pose with the family, but then Jim hands him the camera instead. And so Michael, taking everybody's picture, says, everybody make a funny face. Pam says no. He says, okay, make a serious face, but say banana pants. And somebody does. <laughs> and then Michael tries to take a selfie with the family in the background, but Jim takes away the camera before he's able to. In another scene, Jim says that today didn't go as planned. It wasn't as small and sweet. It was smallish and sweetish. Pam jokes, smallish and sweetish, like a meatball. <laughs> <laughs> yes, like a meatball. Like a meatball. Uh, there's a brief glimpse of Dwight putting his business cards in the hymnals in the uh, sanctuary. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> like, not the place, Dwight. Not the time, no. not the place. Not appropriate. None of He's using the whole thing as a sales opportunity. And Aaron also tells us that Gabe adopts families. And Gabe has a talking head says uh, they usually send pictures. And so he's showing off pictures in his wallet of families he's adopted. And he used to send his picture until one kid got his whole village to save up and send him a bag of rice. And so he doesn't send his picture anymore. Because he looks like the charity. <laughs> yeah. The charity case. Ryan has a talking head. He went down to the Gulf Coast to quote-unquote volunteer. He admits that it was a huge party, to say the least, and that the BP guys are wild. I... <laughs> yeah, he, he says it turned into a total... 
duck fest. Uh, yep. Yeah. <laughs> because they're on the coast. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> uh, we missed out. There was a, a, a short deleted scene where Andy's first getting on the bus and he says, beer me a shirt. We haven't heard that since what? Uh, traveling salesman? Beer me something? Mm-hmm. I, I, yeah. I, I think he introduced it in that episode and I don't think we've heard it since. Uh, so he says, beer me a shirt. And then he looks out the window and Aaron is standing up next to Gabe, his arms around her. And she waves. Gabe doesn't look happy. Andy's face falls. And then he's told, oh, we don't have any more shirts, but here, you can have a pin instead. Which is why we don't see him wearing a shirt in the episode, but we do see Michael wearing one. Right. Uh, This one's quite nice. Jim gives a nice speech about his daughter, Cece. She was named after Pam's grandmother, Cecilia, and after Jim's grandmother, Marie. So Cecilia Marie Halpert. He talks about how Marie always loved a loud, full house and how nothing ever rattled her, and how she probably would have loved today, even with all of its unplanned surprises at the christening. Um, At the end of the speech, Pam gets a text that she reads aloud. She says, who wants to go pick up Michael and Andy? Because she has no idea what has been going on. And Aaron just grabs her stuff and sprints out of the room. Yeah, without a word, too. She's super keen to go pick them up. I guess she feels... A uh, special obligation to Andy because of their past relationship, and then to Michael because he's her boss. I, I don't know. Yeah. The last deleted scene is Toby sitting in a tree across from the church. He says, you know what, Toby? You're going to be all right. And he looks up and he says, hey there, Birdie. You enjoying your Sunday? And I have got to admit, I was so cruelly hoping that the bird would poop on him and then <laughs> the, the scene would end. But it did not happen, unfortunately. That would have been funny. <laughs> it would have been perfect. Like he he's made peace with everything and then a bird craps on him. But yeah. no such luck. <laughs> so you've got our discussion topic for this episode. I do. What is it that led Michael and Andy to attempt to ride to Mexico? Was it being wrapped up in the good feelings of being at church? Was it an escape from their loneliness? Was it impressing people? Uh, I I think there are a few different answers that we could give, but I didn't know if you thought one weighed more heavily than the others. So for Michael, as I said, I think it's the sense of community and he doesn't get that from the office or from his life too much. And he goes to church one time and my goodness, everyone's so nice and they shake your hand and they say good morning. And it's a social experience, a, a large part of church is. And just being in an environment where people are likely to be way nicer to you than in your everyday life makes him, I think, get on the bus. Andy, I think, is a little bit more complicated. I think I think he's kind of running away from Aaron at this point. I think he sees Aaron and Gabe together and happy, and he just wants to escape that. But I, I think that could be taken a few different ways. I think I agree with you on both counts, uh, which I don't know if I always thought that way for Andy. Uh, like I said earlier, I think I thought at first he was maybe trying to impress her, but especially with the deleted scene where he sort of looks out forlornly at Gabe and Aaron cuddling up next to each other, he mm-hmm. does seem to be escaping his loneliness more. Um, it almost reminds me of Michael back in Money in season four when he tries to run away from his problems. He says, I'm running away from my problems and it feels good. And so yeah. Andy's maybe trying to do a version of that. And of course, they, they both change their minds, but at least for 45, 46 glorious more, uh, minutes, <laughs> they, they had escaped their problems and were seeking a life of community and uh, chari- well, charity is not the right word, community and helping other people. So moving on to our next episode, Viewing Party. It aired on November 11th, 2010, directed by Ken Whittingham, written by John Vitti. You know, Ken Weddingham is a name that we haven't heard in a long time. He did a lot of season one, season two stuff. Yeah, I was just thinking season two. Um, so he's back. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Gabe and Aaron have been dating for about three months now, so they decide to throw their first party together at Gabe's apartment, inviting all the Dunder Mifflin Scranton employees over to eat pizza and to watch Glee. Remember when Glee was a thing? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Aaron places a lot of importance on the party as an opportunity for Michael to become closer with Gabe, but Michael resists and tries to take over the party. This is another episode that I don't feel like is too huge, not too much happens, but we do get a lot of really interesting Michael um, character stuff. So at first, Michael, when Aaron is inviting him, pretends to be super busy, doesn't know what Glee is, 
kind of rejects her at first, but it turns out he's really interested in going. He's a big gleek, he calls himself. Very into going. He likes Aaron, they get along. Um, who he does not get along with is Gabe. He spends the entire episode getting progressively more and more annoyed with Gabe. And we'll dig into that a bit more, I think, in my discussion topic, but mm -hmm. it's like really aggressive, <laughs> his his hate for Gabe. He approaches Kevin in the kitchen at Dunder Mifflin. And Kevin asks, hey, Michael, are you going to be there? And he says, yes. Kevin says, yes, as well. He says, because you have to go to the boss's party, right? And uh-oh, he did not say the right words. Michael is upset because Kevin called Gabe the boss. And he says, Gabe's not the boss. And Kevin starts to renege as well. He says, that's right, because you're the boss. And Daryl and Oscar were in the background. But as Michael turns around to ask, do you guys think Gabe is the boss too? They, they're gone. So he can't ask them. But that that's what sort of overcomes Michael's mind as he progresses th with his annoyance throughout the rest of the episode. When they get to the party, he seems less than impressed with Gabe's nice place or his whole make your own pizza night or the fact that he bakes in an oven, he points out. Uh, I think a lot of people do that, but that's okay. And it's like he tries to overcompensate as the boss. He tries to take control of the party. He tries to turn up the volume. He moves the party to another room. And it's because he's the boss. And even though the party is at Gabe's place, the boss is still in charge. Is sort of what he seems to try and to be asserting. Erin is desperate for these two to get along. She convinces Michael to go help Gabe in the kitchen, trying to force them into the same room. And when they get tense, she starts spouting off random facts to lighten the mood. Sort of like uh, Secretary's Day when she just had all these facts to like talk about in case the conversation lulled she's doing that here a little bit too um clearly uncomfortable and nervous um and michael gets more and more agitated and upset he even tells pam privately that he has a loaded gun in his desk drawer at work and asks her to shoot him if he ever starts acting like gabe pam says you have a gun michael says eh, somewhere <laughs> well oh maybe you want to find that <laughs> But that's incredibly shocking if that's true. That's a huge surprise to me. But apparently, yeah, if he's telling the truth, that's that's huge. I would bet that because he doesn't know specifically where it is, it's almost something like Dwight gave him as a mm. means of self-defense. I, I, I don't picture Michael as a person who would go out and get a gun and bring it to work. That is definitely more of a Dwight thing. And it might not have even been for Michael's self-defense. It might have just been... Nobody's going to check the boss's desk for one of my weapons because we, we know that Dwight has hidden stuff around. And so maybe Michael found it. Anyways, that's my sort of headcanon that I just made up. Uh, oh, makes sense <laughs> to me. <laughs> uh, but what, what gets me also about that quote about shooting him, he says, if I ever act like Gabe, act like that weenie Gabe, he says specifically, what does he mean act like Gabe? I mean, we haven't seen a whole lot of Gabe yet. We've talked a little bit about how he has this sort of insecurity need to prove himself with joe specifically and yeah maybe he's a little eccentric in his tastes he's got the french ads up in his living room he's got japanese decorations in his bedroom he's got 1970s music hardware as ryan points out there's lots of different things eclectic things in his place but he's really not all that weird from what we've seen so I think this will go into your discussion topic as well, so we, we don't have to dive further in. But I just wanted to ask for a second, what does it mean to act like Gabe? I really don't know, except that I think Michael just finds him annoying, maybe with his eclectic, eccentric interests, or I don't know, he's sort of an awkward guy. I mean, there, I think we've mentioned this before, that there are people with, who just get under your skin and you don't know why you dislike them. And mm -hmm. I feel like for Michael, that's Gabe. That's also Toby. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think he just can't figure out how to how to not make uh, Gabe crawl under his skin. Yeah, we'll we'll talk about that more here in a bit. But uh, after that scene with Gabe in the kitchen, where Aaron is trying to sort of force a friendship, Michael storms out and he kills the cable outside at the cable box. It's it's just awful. It's like he's he's trying to assert control over the party by shutting off the party, which doesn't make sense, but that, that's Michael logic for you. And after he goes back upstairs and everybody's devastated and everybody's trying to figure out how to get it to work, he says, hold on, I got an idea. He goes back outside 
and Aaron follows him and catches him undoing what he did in the first place. And she confronts him. And this is actually a moment I talked about on a recent bonus episode as a, a sad moment of the show. He says to Aaron, why do we need to like Gabe? She says, I don't care about everybody else. I care if you, Michael, like Gabe. And he says, why, why do you care what I think? Because I'm not your father. And the ball drops. And her face falls. And thank goodness, Michael then understands what this has all been about. Is Aaron, who grew up in foster homes, who's never known her own parents, who's never had any sort of consistency with a father figure in her life, looks up to Michael as her father. And in that moment, it's almost like Michael is disowning her. Like, no, you can't be my daughter. You're not my daughter. So why are you trying to force this on me? But in understanding that, he does make amends, which is nice. I'm forgetting exactly where I saw this. I think it was a deleted scene to Secretary's Day as well, where she said something like, it's really, 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 really important to me that Michael likes me. There are those people in your life that you just want to impress so badly, and Michael's one of those people for me. That's I'm totally butchering it, but that's sort of the message she was conveying. Mm -hmm. And that is true here in an even bigger way, is like, she thinks of Michael as a father figure. Like if she were to get married tomorrow, Michael, she would want Michael walking her down the aisle. You know, that's, mm -hmm. that's who Michael is to her. And Michael, I don't think realized that until this moment. And there's a long silence after he says why I'm not your father. And I'm surprised and glad that he realized what he said and what that implied and what that meant for her without her having to say anything. Mm -hmm. And so he starts kind of bantering back and forth with her as if that, they were father and daughter, and at first she doesn't get it, and then she catches on, like, oh, he's he understands, and so they they kind of play and and uh, make up. And this is a fantastic Michael moment because it's not fixing this idealized relationship that he has with Gabe that Aaron wants him to have with Gabe in sort of asserting himself then as her father figure and acting the role of her father. It then becomes clear why he doesn't like Gabe. Because he's being protective of her. And because, you know, there's no guy out there good enough for my daughter. It's, it's perfect for Michael and it's perfect for Aaron too. It doesn't matter if Michael likes Gabe as long as Michael likes Aaron and is looking out for her. And it, it's taken a long time for Michael to reach this point with Aaron. We saw back in Lecture Circuit, he didn't want to go. No, it wasn't Lecture Circuit. It was Scott's Tots when Aaron went with him to the school to, to confront the, these kids who are graduating, he wanted to go with Pam, but Pam says, no, Aaron's going to go with you. And there have been other opportunities. Secretary's Day was another one where he, somebody wanted him to be close to Aaron and he just couldn't do it. But now he's reached that point where he finally understands the way that she sees him and that endears her to him because he's always wanted to be a father. And so in pretending to be her father, it just fixes everything. And it's no longer Aaron trying to get him to be friends with Gabe. It's more the father's monitoring the daughter's dating life, approves, or in this case, disapproves of the guy, and she's okay with that. And then at the end of the episode, um, for Michael, when he's leaving the party, Michael approaches Gabe on his way out, and he says, if you break that girl's heart, I will kill you. It's just a figure of speech, but seriously, if you break that girl's heart, I will literally kill you and your entire family. <laughs> he is playing the father figure now. He gets it. He gets what Aaron needs, and why their relationship is important to her, Michael's and Aaron's. And so he's fully adopted that role by the end of the episode, just, you know, a scene or two later for him, which is pretty cool. Yeah, it's wonderful. It's a great Michael moment. Going on to other characters, there's a little bit we have with Andy, who, looking around Gabe's place, doesn't see the appeal for Aaron. What is it about Gabe that she likes more than me? And in trying to I don't know, solidarity, like trying to do the same things as Gabe in order to then appeal to Aaron further. I, I don't know what his logic here is, but uh, Ryan had pointed out the five Chinese virility herbs in uh, that were in jars in uh, a room with all the other decorations. 
and he eats the powdered seahorse. He pours it in his wine and drinks it. Uh, it was a bad idea. <laughs> and mm-hmm. he gets sick, and it, it's pretty awful. He gets sick on one of the beds and hides it with the pillow, which is aw- it, it's just bad. Don't do that. <laughs> uh, but he, he's just feeling really bad, and part of it is seahorse, and part of it is just this rejection that he feels with Aaron liking somebody like Gabe over somebody like him. Not only does he get sick, he gets weird mm-hmm. after eating this seahorse. Whatever that does to you, it's some it acts like some kind of drug, and he is hopped up on it. He like goes up to Phyllis and sniffs her and correctly guesses her perfume and then starts doing pull-ups. That's, that's the peak. That's the height. And then he pulls Aaron over, um, wanting five minutes with her. He's sweating and shaking, but he took this powdered seahorse in order to gain courage, and I guess it worked. He talked to her. And he starts to compliment her, but he's about to throw up. I mean, he's mm-hmm. <laughs> really not well, and so he doesn't succeed in, in the long run. Yeah, there's just a little bit he has with Phyllis as well. First, he, as you mentioned, identifies her perfume. It's White Diamonds by Elizabeth Taylor. He says, my nanny used to wear it. Okay, that, that tells us a little bit about Andy right there is uh, a closeness to his nanny. But then also he talks with Phyllis later and has that heart-to-heart conversation. Why does Aaron like Gabe? Do you think they've, you know, had intimate relations? And Phyllis tries to go find out, and it's really awkward and weird. Uh, But yeah, Andy's not really in a better place by the end of the episode. Of all people, Gabe is the one sort of confronting, or not confronting, comforting him at the end. And that's that's it with Andy. There's a bit with Jim and Pam and therefore Dwight and Angela as well. So Cece is what they call reverse cycling, which means she's up at night and asleep during the day. So Pam is very tired because she's up all day and up all night. So Pam is trying to comfort and upset Cece, trying to get her to go to sleep because it's nighttime. When Dwight kind of, oh my gosh, are you going to do this or am I, do I need to do it? So he takes the baby from Pam and Cece immediately calms down. She loves Dwight so much completely falls asleep. Pam makes Dwight hold a baby for the rest of the night because, <laughs> dang it, this is going to end now. I need some sleep. So when Angela sees this, she tells Dwight to meet her in the car. She wants a punch on her card, if you know what I mean. <laughs> There's an actual card. That was not a euphemism. <laughs> Sorry. Well, both. <laughs> both. That was a euphemism unintentionally, but there's an actual card. Okay. Um, <laughs> so... Angela uh, thinks this is very attractive and wants to meet Dwight at her car. Um, And Dwight really wants to go. But Pam says that she knows what's going on. She knows why Dwight has to go. But please, I'm asking you as a friend, please help me out here. So Dwight seems to agree that they're friends, except that Pam married his worst enemy. And he will require (laughs) beer and pizza to think this over. But beer and pizza from Jim. And makes Jim feed him crust first, the pizza. What a psycho. (laughs) <laughs> monster <laughs> makes jim feed him beer and then it's pam that goes out and talks to angela for dwight which is odd now that pam is sort of in the middle of this relationship without either person telling pam about it after pam talks with angela and convinces okay we'll, we'll do this tomorrow night instead uh, Angela asks, did Dwight seem disappointed about having to postpone or, or what? What, what? What did he seem like? And Pam's response is, you know, I'm just sure there's a man out there who would just love and appreciate. And Angela cuts her off. Uh, it reminds me of Phyllis talking to Dwight back in season four, Crime Aid. It was Crime Aid. Uh, when it was right after Angela had... Well, it wasn't right after Angela dumped him that she was dating Andy and Dwight was getting Phyllis's help and tips to try and win Angela back. And he sort of gave her an ultimatum and she chose Andy. And when Dwight confronted Phyllis about this, said, now what do I do? What's the next step? And Phyllis says, there's not a next step. You just find somebody else. And she says, I think everybody deserves to be with somebody who wants to be with them, too. It's the same thing. And it's funny that now both Angela and Dwight have had that said to them about the other person at different points in their relationship. Let's go into funny moments. Let's talk about the cold open. Gabe shows up to an empty office and Aaron beckons him to the annex. She says they caught the Scranton Strangler. So 
end of an era. We've had several <laughs> mentions of this Granton Strangler, and now he is part of a police standoff holed up in his apartment. They're all watching. Michael is pointing out and repeating everything that's happening on the screen. Dwight says that they shouldn't broadcast any of this because it only encourages copycats. Uh, but for the record, I agree with him. But Angela's response is, just say copies. Why do you have to drag cats into this? <laughs> <laughs> and Gabe tells them to go back to work. He says, you never know how long this might last. It might turn into another Waco situation, which is actually referring to the 1993 siege of the Mount Carmel Center outside of Waco, Texas, that lasted 51 days. But Aaron's whole response to that is, it, he, she says, it's pronounced Waco. <laughs> <laughs> um and just going on a couple more things in this cold open, Jim says, some events are so newsworthy, so historic that you have to stop everything to watch. Balloon Boy, Michael Jackson's funeral, things that if you didn't see them live, you wouldn't really care that you didn't see them at all. I've got to say about Balloon Boy, I remember when that happened. I was sitting in a calculus classroom back when I was in high school. It was my senior year. And I used to get CNN text messages on my phone. Uh, for breaking news. And that was a breaking news story <laughs> that I got on my phone in the middle of calculus class was Balloon Boy. So I was a part of that. I was there. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to agree with Jim because I didn't know about Balloon Boy until after the fact. And I don't really care that I missed it. <laughs> but for those following along as it's happening, I'm sure it was just thrilling, you know, because you're like, what's going to happen? But once you know the outcome, it kind of loses its magic, you know? <laughs> And the, the final part of this cold open, I, I want to get your opinion on. Uh, so according to Michael, it is going right down their street. And he runs out to the conference room window and looks out and, hey, look, a police car just drove by. There were the sirens and everything. He said he was the only one to see it, though. Everybody else was a little bit too slow. And he has this whole talking head, he says, uh, he gathers some pebbles from the middle of the road and puts them in a jar. He says, Grandpa, where were you the day the Scranton Strangler was caught? He says, well, kiddo, I was there. I was there. And I'll tell you what, you go sell these and buy yourself a nice spaceship. But then here's the thing. Here's what I want your opinion on. I don't think the police car he saw was part of the chase. Because what we saw on the, the news broadcast on the TV showed three cop cars and they were pretty close to each other. And then they were pretty hot on the Strangler's tail. But Michael only saw a single cop car. And I watched it a few times and I didn't see any hint of other police cars being nearby. Now, unless in that, that few second chunk of time, the, the police car spread out a little bit, maybe for a, 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 a smaller road or something. I don't know. It just didn't seem to me like it could have been the strangler which makes michael's assertion that these pebbles are part of some historic event just completely false i tend to disagree because they were following along and it said okay they're turning down this street which was their street and i kind of feel like he just saw the last cop car go by cuz we didn't see i mean i i didn't watch it several times um so i'm trying to remember that scene specifically like the the visuals but it looks like we just kind of got the tail end of the car. I, I don't know. I have to go rewatch. But I didn't doubt that it was the same chase. Mm, I don't know. We'll see. Uh, well, I guess we won't see. There's there's not like a definite <laughs> answer. But I don't know. I, I think their their street name is Slough Avenue, uh, mm -hmm. 1725 Slough. And I don't remember there being mention of that. But Oh, hmm. Okay. okay I don't know. I don't know. But I did make a note that Michael is making a much bigger deal of this than I think he needs to. Yeah. Because I doubt that the younger generation will ever hear this Grant and Strangler story. No. So I don't think he's going to go sell pebbles for a spaceship. No, I, I, don't, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, another funny moment. Aaron <laughs> is really, really into the idea of Mike and Mike, of Michael and Gabe being friends. But she says that there's this thing on Glee called a mashup where two things that don't go together uh, make one really great song. So take Gabe and take Michael and you get Gay Mike. <laughs> best friends. <laughs> <laughs> gay Mike. Uh, I'm, I'm sure they that would love together. that. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> uh, this is pretty funny too. Michael tells Aaron that his favorite character from Glee is the invalid. He's talking about Artie Abrams. And I know this from the internet, not because I know Glee. 
I've seen uh-huh. <laughs> maybe an episode and a half and a bunch of pregnant teenagers were dancing and it was weird. So I didn't watch anymore. <laughs> um, <laughs> but here's the thing. Artie Abrams was portrayed by Kevin McHale, who played the pizza delivery kid who was held hostage by Michael back in launch party in season four. Mm-hmm. So it all connects. <laughs> I love this quote from Kelly, which I had seen like a season of Glee. And I really, it was one of those things where I didn't enjoy it, but I kept watching because I couldn't stop. <laughs> you just hate watch it. I was like, oh, this is really cheesy. And we're, we were both in choirs and stuff mm-hmm. growing up and everyone's like, oh, is it just like Glee? And you're like, no, yeah. it's definitely, that's so, anyway, I could go on a rant about it, but I won't. <laughs> but Kelly says, and what was with Jesse's sudden turn on Rachel between Dream On and Funk? Where the hell did that, sorry, she didn't say hell. No, she didn't. <laughs> she didn't. <laughs> Your reverse censoring. <laughs> Where the heck did that come from? Honestly, that show, it's just, it's irresponsible. <laughs> she gets so into it. And I just, I guess it's funny if you've seen more than an episode of the show, but it's, um, I just like her, her passion for how ridiculous the show is. Because it is. Yeah, that's what's so funny about it to me, because it, it's throughout the whole episode, we get these moments from Kelly. It's like, I love this roller coaster that watching the show seems to be for Kelly. She yeah. she calls it irresponsible, but she's really into watching it. She hates getting interrupted, uh, is upset when she misses things. It's almost to me like the office writers are making a commentary on Glee fans. Like, why do you keep watching something that's so bad? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not saying Glee's bad necessarily, but if you read between the lines, that might be exactly what I was saying. Uh, <laughs> 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 we'll let you fill that in uh, Dwight uh, Angela asks if he's going to be going to the viewing party and says not by choice with all the feelings to base a show around Glee Thirst now that's a show I'd watch <laughs> and Angela says I'd watch that and then he says tonight might be a convenient nice for us to have some intercourse oh. <laughs> jolly good conversations normal people have because she agrees with your thirst show Hmm. Michael has a talking head. He says, Gabe likes to entertain a lot. And he cooks in an oven and all that jazz. I have a different lifestyle. I have these bags of vegetables that steam right inside their own bag. So I'll get a few ingredients, sit down in front of the TV, bag of vegetables. Before you know it, I'm ready for bed. <laughs> sure. I will admit that most nights, not not most nights, I'm sorry, more often than I'm Gabe in that situation, I might be Michael. It's fine. <laughs> I'm living it's okay do you think michael just stands in front of that screen door with the the plasma <laughs> screen that fits right up against the, the wall with the bag yes. of vegetables in hand just standing I there i hope so <laughs> yeah. the visual is nice <laughs> when dwight has jim feed him and give him beer pam says jim just don't think of it as degrading think of it as you just happen to be moving the pizza six inches this way and he happens to be biting it and Dwight's response is, I prefer for him to think of it as degrading. <laughs> Ouch. Mm. Phyllis has never seen Glee before, and she's quizzing <laughs> Kelly during the show. <laughs> she has questions on every person who comes on screen. Who's that? Kelly says, Finn. Who's that? Rachel. Which one's Glee? <laughs> Kelly says, you have to stop. <laughs> <laughs> Please. <laughs> Andy, when he, he eats the powdered seahorse, he says, I just ate powdered seahorse. I have to admit, I did not think it was going to work, but it is totally working. And we see him doing pull-ups in the doorway. He says, I feel exactly like a seahorse. And then he neighs and then blubbers <laughs> like a horse underwater. <laughs> not the way that works. Aaron is trying to alleviate some tension between Michael and Gabe. These are some of those random facts that I was talking about earlier. And I just love when she does this. It's so weird, but I love it. <laughs> Michael um, is criticizing Gabe's pigs in a blanket he says so these are pizza dogs they're not pigs in a blanket per se aaron says well michael knows everything that there is to know about snacks and gabe was born in 1982 he was the longest baby in the hospital (laughs) okay okay (laughs) um michael says he's the longest baby in this room (laughs) aaron says you know what the longest thing is i've ever seen for me it was the tail from jets and like she's just trying anything so hard so hard just to alleviate the tension it's just painful before he eats a seahorse i guess i'm going out of order here but uh andy is morose lacrimose one of those uh daryl <laughs> approaches him 
and says, Andy, look, all I know is that if I was a girl and I had to choose between the tall dude who loved Asia and the you looking dude who loved sweaters and wearing sweaters, I'd choose you. <laughs> and then he finishes with, and I'd blow your mind. <laughs> <laughs> having a little fantasy just a little bit <laughs> when jim and dwight are doing their weird pizza beer thing in the bedroom kevin comes into the bedroom with a plate of pigs in a blanket he crawls under the covers interrupting them and he just says i just wanted to eat pigs in a blanket in a blanket in a blanket <laughs> i don't blame him it sounds great <laughs> <laughs> last one for me creed uh andy approaches him and says hey creed do you read chinese he says better than english and so he reads the the can on the the powdered seahorse in Chinese. Now the subtitles on the DVD said mock Chinese, but the internet says <laughs> that he actually said, "Do not mix the seahorse with alcohol" in real Chinese, <laughs> and so that makes sense. It explains what happens with Andy for the rest of the episode, and we also saw back in season two in the episode the fight when Creed spoke in Chinese as well, albeit pretty poor Chinese, but both times it has been legitimate Chinese. I'd be curious if any of our listeners speak Chinese. If you want to verify, yeah, Maybe. do it. I, yeah. I want to know the facts. Last one for me, Andy is miserable, throwing up in the bathroom. Gabe asks what happened, and Andy says that he ate four or five powdered seahorses, and Gabe even with all their tension around Aaron, he tries to help. He says he's got just the thing, and he brings in his keyboard. Um, which he doesn't play piano. He plays soundscapes mm. on his keyboard, um, which, why do I always liken this show to Friends? It's really not that much like Friends, but if you've seen <laughs> Friends, Ross does this too, and he has, I forget what he calls them. They might be called soundscapes or something else, but they're the same thing, basically. And it just made me laugh so hard that Andy is puking in a toilet and listening to weird electronic music. <laughs> Earthrise on the moon. Yes. Ugh. Okay. Just what you want. Yeah. <laughs> your your ex's boyfriend uh, helping you puke. <laughs> uh, I, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> uh, going on to deleted scenes, Gabe invites Stanley to the party at the beginning of the episode with a crossword clue. He says 10 letters. Clue is time of your life. And the answer is Gabe's party. And then Stanley, he, he feigns interest for a moment, but then he has a talking head says, why the hell would I go to this? I've got my own idea for tonight. Watching a TV show I want to watch with people I want to watch it with. And he says, NCIS, by myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's an extended scene where Kevin accidentally calls Gabe the boss, which we saw, but there's an extension. Michael admits, fine, Gabe is the boss. You know what else he is? He's a big weirdo. Have you ever seen him eat jello with his chunks of fruit in it? Which just makes me laugh. It's just like a little tidbit, a little bit more about Gabe that he's one of those guys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Michael has a talking head where he says, you know, I don't know Gabe very well. I'm always surprised when I hear his name or when I see him. And then I remember who he is. <laughs> he says, it's sort of like when you hear someone's a serial killer and everyone says, oh, he was so nice and so normal. He says, I wish Gabe was that normal. <laughs> okay. <laughs> serial killer normal. Yeah. Gabe is showing Michael the pizza toppings and Michael is dissatisfied with the options. He rummages through Gabe's kitchen cabinets until he finds cereal and canned noodles. Uh, Gabe says that those are actually for the kid that he mentors, but Michael argues that it is make your own pizza night. So dang it, he's going to make his own pizza. Later, we see Michael take a huge bite of his pasta pizza and spits it in the trash. Yeah, not good. Not good. Because what was it? It was like SpaghettiOs kind of thing and then mm -hmm. like vanilla like, granola, I think. Something like that, yeah. Ugh. So it's like soggy and crunchy at the same time. <laughs> Ugh. A texture problem. Yeah. <laughs> Michael also has a talking head. He says, you know, maybe Gabe got a taste of success too young. When I was Gabe's age, I was a junior salesman just struggling to feed my fish. I had to sleep on the couch because the TV was on the bed. He says, I was Tom Hanks in Big. And Gabe is just so grown up and boring, like Tom Hanks in Philadelphia. <laughs> but it's not the first time we've seen Michael make these associations with Tom Hanks movies. We saw him do that in The Injury as well when he, he had a bloody stump of a foot. <laughs> and he he tried to make everybody feel bad for him and i think he used i'm I'm confirming this now yeah he well one of the same movies he he uses forrest gump and then he uses uh philadelphia no big 
Big. Yeah, yeah, big. But he thinks it's Philadelphia. Oh, right. Yeah. There it is. And then I think the last deleted scene, um, a short little one, Jim wakes Pam up from a nap, and CC is sleeping too. So finally, uh, the reverse cycling, I think it's called, has ended. Dwight fixed it. Um, and then Jim's like, come on, Pam, I can like carry one of you. So all is well in the Halpert household, finally. Yay. And so our discussion topic for this episode, um, I just want to dive a little bit deeper into why Michael hates Gabe so much. Is it just the boss thing that people think Gabe is Michael's boss? Is it a Toby effect? I mean, just like Toby, we don't really know why Michael hates him so much. So there's no real answer here, but I just want to know what you think. I have sort of been building a little bit of a theory over our discussion. And I think it might be because of Gabe's youthful success. Uh, We know from what Michael has said previously this season that Gabe is 27. And Michael was trying to use that against him, married to his work. Uh, I guess it was season six. He's married to his work. He's only 27 years old, doesn't have a girlfriend. Well, now Gabe has a girlfriend. He's still 27, 28, whatever. Uh, And he is high-ish up in the corporate world of this company. And people even view him as a boss. And so it's, it's almost a jealousy thing where Michael's in his late 40s now. And he's still just a lonely regional manager of this this paper supplier. And so I, I think there's just a little bit of jealousy maybe of the success that Gabe has had so early in life versus the success that Michael is has not enjoyed with many more years. Yeah, I think that's definitely a part of it. I, I tend to think that it's sort of these, for lack of a better word, dorkier guys that Michael just hates. Like we've got Toby, we've got Gabe. Dwight, I think, might fall into that category if he wasn't so, like, such a strong personality, Mm -hmm. I guess. But Toby and Gabe are both quieter guys, kind of, like, nerdy, you know, dorky guys, which Michael, I think, just, I don't know, I think it just kind of irks him for some reason. And they're unusual to Michael. I, I, I can't quite word it, what I'm thinking, but I think it's just one of those things that got under Michael's skin Mm -hmm. and he just can't like him. And I didn't think that he knew what he felt for Aaron or his like paternal feelings. Mm -hmm. Cause by the end of this episode, he sort of realizes that he does see her as sort of a daughter. And maybe that's why as well. He just, he couldn't like Gabe because she, cause he's protective of Aaron. And you know, part of it might have been the same thing that made him dislike Charles Minor was the, mm-hmm. it's a ever watchful eye trying to get him to change how he's doing things and trying to oh, hold yeah. him accountable. And so that's part of it as well. Even though Gabe doesn't really have the same authority that Charles did, he's more of just a liaison to corporate. Uh, he has that sort of air of authority, that that illusion of authority, if you will. Um, and so I think that might be part of it as well. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that. Well, that is the end of the official 72nd episode of An American Workplace. We hope you all have a very Merry Christmas because it has been a very nice year for our podcast and for hopefully you, the listener, as well. And we've got almost another year to go. Uh, And so Merry Christmas. If you would like to reach us, you can do so at facebook.com slash workplace pod or at workplace pod on Twitter. Please continue going over to Apple Podcasts where you can rate, review, and subscribe. And you can email us feedback and ideas to workplacepod at gmail.com. You can find me on Twitter at ktlady623 or at facebook.com slash katie.white. The best place for me, as always, is on Twitter at chadadada, that is C-H-A-D-A-D-A-D-A. Also, facebook.com slash chad.hopkins. And there's my other podcast, Cinescope, which can be found where other podcasts can be found and at thecinescopepodcast.com. And show notes and all contact information can also be found at workplacepodcast.com. If you want a shout out and more of an American Workplace each week, including access to our discussion outline, notes, a logo sticker, bonus episodes, and live streams, check out our Patreon page and pick the support level that you think is worth it at patreon.com slash workplace pod. That is all for this week. Thank you for joining us to watch one of our favorite shows, The Office, here on episode 72 of An American Workplace. 
Make sure to join us in episode 73, which I guess is going to be in the new year. Hey, yeah. for our discussion on the next two episodes of season seven, woof.com and China. Bye. Bye.